Hello and welcome to Auto Shenanigans. How the devil are you? Have you had a good week? My name is John. Thank you very much for joining me for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. Today is the start of a journey crossing England from west to east along the M62 motorway. At 107 miles long, it's the sixth longest motorway in the country, and my goodness, have we got a lot to be getting on with. Coming up in this two-part special, we'll be travelling across six counties, looking at interchanges, collieries and viaducts, and I get as high as I can on the M62. The M62, then. It runs for 107 miles, starting on the east side of Liverpool and heads over towards Manchester, where it becomes the M60 for a bit. It then starts up again on the north side of Manchester and heads over the Pennines, past Leeds, before coming to an end near a tiny village in Yorkshire called North Cave. There's an awful lot for us to be getting on with, but luckily some time has been saved because the M62 is missing its first three junctions. Back in the early 70s, a plan was put together to build a vast motorway and road network in and around Liverpool. Part of that plan involved the M62 with the initial design looking a bit like this, where the motorway would start further to the west at the Islington Radial, and we can see where the first three junctions would have been. As is clear today, these roads and motorway connections were never built. The problem realised by the local council was that in order for this road network to function, it had to be completed and before it was fully built, it would cause nothing but further problems. The estimated time of construction was around 13 years, but the final nail in the coffin was Liverpool's economic decline over the coming years and this saw an end to any ambitious road building projects. So the M62 starts at Junction 4 then. This junction was built in 1976 and was supposed to be a temporary terminus for the motorway, of course with the intention of it continuing further west. With that never happening, the temporary terminus became permanent. With traffic levels running at around 100,000 vehicles per day, it's one of the more congested areas in Liverpool, and in 2019, plans were announced to make improvements to the junction and surrounding roads. I concur, I had to sit in traffic to get here. Nightmare. These plans would see the demolition of the Queen's Drive flyover and a new roundabout and underpass installed. The estimated cost is around £700 million with a build time of seven years, but in 2022, after paying for years of planning work, changed their mind. The reason for this is that they wanted to further consider the environment and see how they could incorporate it into the road layout. The result of this is twice the planning cost and delays to the project before it's even started. Nice one. As it is at the moment, it looks like nothing's happening with it. Junction 6 is also known as the Tarbock Roundabout. We looked at it in detail in our M57 video, so feel free to check that out. But today we're going to be looking at the bridge that you'll see just after junction 6 of the M62. It's an old railway bridge that allowed trains to access the nearby Cronton Colliery that operated between 1913 and 1984. Today there's nothing left to be seen of the colliery and in its place will soon be hundreds of square feet of commercial units. These will surely complement the new built housing estate found on the other side of the motorway, with the bridge sitting in between being the only reminder of this area's history. Up next is Burton Wood Services, which you'll find at junction 8. The westbound services was demolished in 2008 to make way for warehousing and as a result this has left a couple of pieces of abandoned infrastructure for us to explore. Hiding behind the Travelodge Hotel is an old stretch of carriageway that used to be the exit slip road for the services. There's also a secret underpass that you'll need to look through the bushes for. It used to link the two sides together but since the westbound services demolition the underpass has been closed. Junction 10 is where the M62 and the M6 meet at an interchange that's called a partially unrolled cloverleaf. Apparently. It's quite a large interchange and it's probably one of the largest interchanges we've got on the motorway network, but what's interesting about this one is that the designers got it a little bit wrong. It wasn't their fault to be fair. When designing it, it was thought that the heaviest traffic would run between the M6 South and the M62 West, so the junction's been set up with easy traffic movements in those directions. It turns out that they weren't correct and the heaviest traffic tends to run between the M6 South and the M62 East. The interchange does allow for traffic movements in those directions, but on a much smaller scale. Ideally, the interchange might be reversed. Just after Junction 11, Holcroft Lane crosses over the motorway, and it's here that we find a secret junction. It's been a little while since we've seen one of these, and in this case, it's used for maintenance vehicle access. That is all. Moving on to another secret junction that's found just before Junction 12 or the Eccles Interchange. This time though, the secret junction is a little bit more extensive with a bridge connecting both sides and unlike before, there doesn't seem to be any connection to public roads, so it's its own self-contained thing. This leads me to believe that it's most likely used as a turning point for emergency vehicles. Onto the Eccles interchange itself and at this interchange the M60, M62 and the M602 all meet. And it's also at this interchange where the M62 comes to an abrupt end. Now I know for sure that the M62 ends in East Yorkshire, so something's amiss here. Let's just double check. M62? M60, 
M602. Yep, looks to me like we're missing some M62. What's the deal with that then? It's complicated. The OG plan for the M62 was for it to be a western loop motorway around Manchester. Nothing like what we know of the M62 today. Had the motorway been built as planned, it would have looked a little bit like this. And then we need to consider the M52 motorway, which doesn't exist. It was going to, and it would have followed this route. However, when sorting all of this out in the 60s or whatever, somebody changed their mind, having had the genius idea of the M62 being a cross-country, almost coast-to-coast -coast motorway. So they fucked off the M52 to become the M62, and they also renumbered this section to the M63. So boom, there's your M62. At the same time, we also got the M64 motorway, which was later renumbered to the M602. This is why the M62 takes a sharp left turn at the Eccles interchange. It was never supposed to be routed that way, but it is. But it isn't. In 1998, the M60 happened, the creation of a circular motorway around Manchester. To make it, they basically stole other bits of road, jigged a few things around, and started printing M60 on all the signs. Of course, that's a video for another day, but during this process, they robbed part of the M62 to become the M60, which is why the M62 just ends here. A quick drive around the M60. Well, I say quick, we all know that's a lie. But after sitting in traffic for 17 hours, we arrive at Simister Island, where the M62 starts back up again. And as a result of all of that M60 nonsense, we've lost junctions 13 to 17, so the M62 jumps from junction 12 to 18. Simister Island is not only where the M62 starts back up again, it's also where you'll find the M60 and the M66 motorways. I've already covered the M66 motorway, where we look at Simister Island in a little bit more detail, so there you go. Junction 20 is another motorway interchange. This time it's the M62 with the A627 brackets M. And if you're driving on the M62, it's fairly straightforward. You drive straight through the interchange. However, if you're on the A627M, things are a little bit different where you've got traffic lights and a roundabout to contend with. What you need is some sort of flyover to take the A627 brackets M over the interchange. And indeed, that was the original plan. We can see where space has been left for that to be added, but for some reason, they never bothered building it. After Junction 21, the motorway starts to head up into the Pennines, but before we get there, the motorway passes over Longdon End Brook on the Rakewood Viaduct. Longdon Brook starts a short distance away up at Winty Hill before making its way down into Hollingworth Lake where it serves as its main feeder stream, and on the way it passes underneath a 140 foot high Rakewood Viaduct. It was built in 1966 and isn't that long at 280 yards. A combination of its height and the surrounding terrain means it suffers from strong crosswinds. Next up, and it's time to get high. In altitude, that is. <laughs> Just as you approach Junction 22, you're driving on the highest motorway in the country at a staggering 1,221 feet, which doesn't really seem like that high, but it's the highest motorway. Still, the views are lovely, weather permitting, and I seem to have lucked out. Also, each of the slip roads at Junction 22 have got a set of cattle grids, so we know we're definitely in the countryside. You'll also not be able to miss the Windy Hill transmitter. It's become a bit of a landmark for travellers on the M62. It was built in 1951 as part of a nuclear attack warning system, and if you'd like to learn more about this, check out this video by one of YouTube's largest mass debaters. After Junction 22, we begin our descent, and before long, perhaps the most famous motorway landmark comes into view. The owner of Stothall Farm refused to sell his property when it came to constructing the M62, and as a result, the M62 had to be built around him. That's a myth. It's a load of bull shit. If they wanted to buy your land to build a road, they'd issue a compulsory purchase order and turf you out. You wouldn't have a choice. It is true that they had intended to bulldoze the farm and put the M62 right through the middle. However, it turns out that the ground underneath the farm is not capable of supporting a motorway. Therefore, the carriageways were routed around the farm on ground that was far more stable. It had nothing to do with the owner not selling. And there we are then, guys. That's all we've got time for this week. I hope you liked the video. If you did, there is, of course, a button specifically for that. Join me next week for part two, and if you haven't subscribed already, please consider doing so. I wouldn't want you to miss out. Enjoy the rest of your week, whatever it is you get up to. My name's John. You've been watching Also Shenanigans, and I'll see you guys next time for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.